Safety and health in our business must be a part of our daily operation. Safety is every employee's responsibility at all levels. No tradesmaster's employee is required to work at a job site that he or she deems unsafe. Your help in detecting hazards and controlling them is a condition of your employment. Inform your supervisor of any situation beyond your authority or ability to correct. Trademaster employees, personal safety is of primary importance. Our goal is nothing less than zero accidents and injuries. Sexual harassment. Sexual harassment, according to law, is a form of sex discrimination that involves unwelcome sexual advances. Requests for sexual favors or other verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature that results in a person's work, pay, or advancement being affected, or that interferes with a person's ability to concentrate on the job. Fire safety. Smoking is not permitted in the fuel storage area. Smoke only in areas designated by your supervisor. Severe weather. When severe weather is approaching, check with your foreman, tie down any loose materials, stay away from any objects that may be struck by lightning like a crane. Work at high elevations should stop. Check with your foreman in case work activities have been ordered to stop. Personal Protective Equipment, or PPE. You are required to wear a hard hat any time you are on the job. Injuries have been caused by various number of events, like thrown tools or even a swinging excavator bucket. Severe head injuries usually leave permanent damage. You are required to wear a safety vest any time working near the roadway. You are required to wear safety glasses any time you are cutting or operating powder-actuated tools. Grinding operations require eye protection. Bench grinders, portable grinders, and cutoff saws require eye protection at all times. Always check with your foreman if you are not sure of the proper PPE. You are required to wear a good pair of work boots at all times during working hours. They will protect your feet against puncture accidents. You are required to wear rubber work boots while working in concrete. Rubber boots are to be provided by you. If you are using special equipment, like a jackhammer, you are required to wear additional foot protection, like metatarsal guards, which will protect the top of your foot. Chemical and concrete burns. Each year, hundreds of individuals are burned due to not properly protecting themselves from wet concrete. It is your responsibility to wear long pants, shirts, waterproof boots, and gloves when working with wet concrete. If wet concrete makes contact with your skin, wash it off thoroughly. Hazard Communication What is HASCOM? The Hazard Communication Standards goal is to be sure employers and employees know about chemical hazards and how to protect themselves. This should help you reduce the number of chemical illnesses and injuries. You have a right to know what chemicals are in the areas you'll be working in, what are the hazards of those chemicals, how to protect yourself from those hazards. Chemical Manufacturers Chemical manufacturers and importers must develop a Material Safety Data Sheet, or MSDS, for each hazardous chemical they produce or import. An MSDS sheet must be kept for each chemical at the job site. This information is available to you. Simply ask your foreman. For example, the Material Safety Data Sheet provided by Hansen Aggregates is for concrete. The section in red explains that the short-term skin contact may result in minor irritation. They recommend that you wear protective equipment. Trench safety. A burning motor grader accident. This tragic accident killed a 41-year-old motor grader operator who struck a 10-inch propane pipeline while doing ditch digging work. The accident was needless. If the person had located the pipeline prior to doing the digging, this accident would have been avoided. With firefighters providing a watery shield, a backhoe operator prepares to move this machine so the gas main he damaged can be repaired. The operator failed to locate the gas line prior to doing the excavation. Workers on a highway construction project severed a 900 pair and a 100 pair telephone cable, cutting off service to 600 local homes. An employee was working in a trench 13 feet deep when it unexpectedly collapsed. The impact from the dirt caused internal bleeding, which resulted in his death. 
Dirt weighs 3,000 pounds per cubic yard. No emergency procedures in case of a rescue. The trench was 12 feet deep and only slightly sloped when the initial trench collapse occurred. One employee was trapped waist deep in the bottom of the trench. When his friend jumped in to attempt a rescue, there was a second collapse and both were killed. Do not attempt a rescue unless you are trained. The difference between an excavation and a trench is one wall of dirt to worry about instead of two. Someone had excavated this area to install a storage tank. This wall of soil was previously disturbed and less stable and more likely to collapse. When it collapsed, it buried and suffocated one of the employees while narrowly missing the second. No employee will be allowed in a trench deeper than five feet unless there is a trench box in the excavation or it is sloped back or has shores placed in the trench. It is your responsibility to get a ladder from the storage area and make sure it is placed in the trench prior to your entering. Never enter a trench without your supervisor's permission. Exposure to falling loads. No employee shall be permitted underneath loads handled by lifting or digging equipment. All excavations should be protected with a barricade. If you see an unprotected excavation, report it to your supervisor immediately. When a trench box is used, a worker is only protected while they remain in the trench box. Never leave the trench box protected area. Working around heavy equipment. When a truck is dumping its load, do not stand to the left or right of the vehicle. The truck can tip over, crushing you underneath. This worker found himself in a bad area and had to run away from the falling truck. Remember to always maintain adequate distance from the truck during loading and unloading operations, avoiding any falling objects. Do not depend on heavy equipment operators to see you. It is your responsibility to stay clear of this equipment. You must be extra careful when walking directly behind or in front of the equipment or wherever there are blind spots. The operator will not be able to see you when standing in these areas. This worker has chosen a very poor spot to retie his shoes. He is in the blind spot of the front end loader. A good rule of thumb is if you cannot see the operator or his mirrors, he cannot see you. This could happen to you. All large earth moving equipment should have backup alarms. Employees should always keep a safe distance behind these vehicles. The alarm alone does not make it safe. You may not have enough time to get out of the way. This worker did not pay attention to the backup alarm and was crushed. He was in the blind spot of the water truck. A good rule of thumb is if you cannot see the operator or his mirrors, he cannot see you. This worker was not aware of his surroundings and was crushed. This employee approached the excavator from the operator's blind side. The equipment swung around, hit the victim, and crushed him against the wall. Always buckle your seat belt prior to turning on your equipment. This front end loader approached the top edge of the trench wall to unload. The trench wall collapsed, causing the loader to slide into the trench killing the worker. As an equipment operator, know where the members of the ground crew are and be sure to avoid them. As a heavy equipment operator, always look behind you when traveling in reverse. Proper transportation around the construction site. Transportation safety driver's responsibility. This worker was standing on the back bumper while the truck was backing up. Other workers were sitting in the bed. The truck hit a bump, causing the employee to fall backwards. The driver could not react in time and the worker was run over. Transportation safety. Riding equipment is never allowed. These employees were riding on this vehicle against company policy. Many workers have been hurt or killed due to unforeseen circumstances when they have fallen, been thrown out, or just plain slipped off the equipment. Housekeeping. Always maintain the job storage trailers in an orderly fashion. Do not just dump the equipment on the ground. Oxygen and acetylene bottles must be stored upright at all times. If you see them laying down, report it to your supervisor. Clean up any liquid spills immediately. Let's avoid slip and trip hazards. Loading and unloading equipment. 
Chains are used to secure loads. Always check the chain for damage, stretched, or excessively worn links. Never exceed the manufacturer's working load limits. When unloading equipment, always wear seat belts. Follow manufacturer's recommendations. Know correct loading and unloading procedures. Select level ground whenever possible. Chalk the wheels. Watch for power lines. Clean windows. Use ramps of adequate size and strength. A police officer investigates the scene of an accident where a lift operator was crushed to death under a forklift. The victim was unloading a forklift at a construction site when it slipped off the trailer. The victim jumped, but the forklift landed on him, crushing him to death. Always wear your seat belt when loading or unloading machinery. Never try and jump off the equipment. Electrical safety. The problem? 411 deaths per year. From 1980 through 1992, 5,348 workers died from contact with electrical energy, an average of 411 deaths per year. Electrocutions were the fifth leading cause of death, accounting for 7% of all workplace fatalities. The problem? Common electrical hazards. Shocks, burns, explosions, fires. Introduction, how electricity works. Three factors determine the resistance of a substance to the flow of electricity. What is it made of? Its size, its temperature. Substances with very little resistance are good conductors, such as copper or aluminum metal. Substances with such a high resistance are insulators, such as glass, porcelain, plastic, and dry wood. What is the electrical circuit? No current flows unless there is a complete loop. A generator cannot force electrons to move through a wire unless they have a path to return to the generator. Current flow may be compared to ventilation. Water in a hose. Overload hazards. Wires have a maximum amount of current they can carry safely. When too many devices are plugged into a circuit, the current can heat the wires enough to cause a fire. When you plug a 4 amp motor into an outlet, 4 amps will flow. If you add 4, 6, and 8 amp motors at the same outlet, it will receive an accumulative and dangerous total of 22 amps. To prevent too much current in a circuit, a breaker or fuse is used. If the breaker is too large for the wires used, an overload will not be detected and a fire can still result. How shocks occur. Shock results when the body becomes part of the electrical circuit. Typically, shock occurs when a person contacts both wires of an energized circuit, one wire of an energized circuit, and the ground, a metallic part in contact with the energized wire like a power tool, while the person is also in contact with the ground. A worker got a strong jolt between 15 and 20 amps when he touched the door of a metal cabinet he was drilling. The electrical cord he was using had a bare wire exposed. That made contact with the metal as the cord was laying inside the cabinet. OSHA's Fatal Facts Death Due to Missing Ground Wire An employee was climbing a metal ladder to hand a drill to the journeyman above. When the victim reached the third rung of the ladder, he received an electric shock that killed him. The ground wire was making contact with the energized wire, therefore energizing the drill's frame. The drill was not double insulated, and the extension cord was missing the ground pin. Electrical hazards, shock injuries. Shocks result in indirect injuries, or falls, strikes, or cuts. Direct injuries, or damage or cell death, actually caused by the flow of electricity through the body. The high resistance of skin transforms electrical energy into heat, which has produced these burns around the entrance point the dark spot in the center of the wound. This man was lucky the current narrowly missed his spinal cord. Side effects of electrical shock. Three time-based categories, immediate, secondary, and long-term. Immediate effects are confusion, amnesia, headache, breathing stops, heart stops, and burns. Secondary, lasting an hour to days, paralysis, Muscle pain, vision abnormalities, swelling, 
headache, cardiac irregularities. Long-term, lasting weeks to years, paralysis, speech impairment, writing impairment, loss of taste. High voltage electrical burns. Immediately after a shock. Eight days later. Sanzen, Atlas of Acute Hand Injuries. 1980. A journeyman with six years' experience was connecting temporary lighting to a hot panel box. He assumed when flipping the circuit breaker, it would give him adequate protection. When the bare ground wire made contact with a live circuit, the arc blast gave him second-degree burns on his neck and third-degree burns on his hands. He immediately pulled away, but the arc blast continued long enough to melt the back of the panel. Electrical Flash Burn A Color Atlas of Accidents and Emergencies, 1984 the victim was the wiring of an outdoor floodlight on the sidewall. The victim was on a 35-foot aluminum ladder and had climbed about 18 feet. The victim used insulated wire strippers to remove insulation from a cable containing two copper wires. The 110-volt circuit had not been de-energized at the panel box. The victim's right thumb and right index finger contacted the uninsulated part of the wire stripper. The victim was shocked and fell to the ground. The foreman gave CPR while EMS personnel were summoned, but the victim was dead on arrival at the hospital. Guarding of live parts. Cardboard is not adequate covering for an energized control panel. An adequate cover must be hard enough and stable enough that it cannot easily be removed. Any energized cabinet must completely be covered to prevent accidental contact of live electrical parts. You must guard live parts by location in a vault, room, or similar enclosure that is accessible only to qualified persons. Entrances to rooms and other guarded locations containing exposed live parts shall be marked with warning signs forbidding unqualified persons to enter. This is an example of a poor lighting route. Wiring is too low. You must guard live parts by elevating energized wires 8 feet or more above the floor or other working surfaces, and so installed to exclude unqualified persons. This is an example of a good lighting route. Wires are at least 8 feet high and are secured every 10 feet. The employer shall use either ground fault circuit interrupters, as specified in OSHA's standard 1926.404B12, or an assured grounding conductor program specified in OSHA's standard 192.404B13. On a construction site, you must protect employees with an electrical shock by either a ground fault circuit interrupter or assured grounding program. Assured grounding program. A written program including the specific procedures adopted by the employer, which will be made available at every job site. Equipment must be tested for continuity and shall be electrically continuous. Each receptacle and plug shall be tested for correct attachment of the ground conductor. Tests shall be conducted every three months. All tests performed shall be recorded. First quarter white, second quarter green, third quarter red, fourth quarter orange. Ground fault protection. A 22-year-old carpenter was working using a portable electric saw. Power to operate the portable power tool was supplied by a temporary pole that was not grounded 50 feet away. The victim used a homemade cord plugged into the receptacle on the pole and a UL approved cord connected to the homemade cord to the saw. He was shocked throughout the morning. As the victim climbed down the ladder, he was shocked and fell from the ladder, landing in a puddle of water still holding the saw. A co-worker disconnected the power cord but too late to save the victim. All temporary power tools should be protected with a GFCI. All GFCI receptacles should be used tested before use. Electrocution. Time until fibrillation can start. Temporary wiring. Runs of open conductors shall be located where the conductor shall not be subject to physical damage, and the conductor shall be fastened at intervals not to exceed 10 feet. No branch circuit conduit shall be laid on the floor. Must be off the ground. 
Conductor is off the ground. Temporary wiring. Light bulbs are protected by a plastic cage. All lamps for general illumination shall be protected from accidental contact or breakage. Metal case sockets shall be grounded. Temporary lights shall not be supported by their electrical cords unless the cord and light is designed for that means of suspension. Cord wrapped around a fire system is a violation and no protection was provided for the light bulb. This is an example of a poor lighting route. Light fixture and wiring is exposed and is an electrical hazard. These flexible cords are damaged and the electrical conductors are exposed. There is a potential danger of shock, burns, or fire. Extension cord sets used with power tools must be three-wire type, so they permit grounding of any electrical equipment connected to them and are designed for hard and extra-hard usage. Hard or extra-hard usage are derived from the National Electrical Code and are required to be indelibly marked approximately every foot along the length of the cord. Cabinet Boxes and Fittings Unused openings, the conduit broken from the fitting, is a violation. Conductors entering boxes, cabinets, or fittings shall be protected from abrasion. Openings through which conductors enter shall be effectively closed. Unused openings in cabinets, boxes, and fittings shall also be effectively closed. Empty slots between circuit breakers must be protected properly. Duct tape is not a proper means of protection. Flexible cords and cabinets. Flexible cords shall be used only in continuous links without splice or tape. A junction box is not allowed. If they are spliced, then the splice must retain the insulation, outer sheath properties, and usage characteristics. The metal cap is waiting to shock someone. Flexible cords must connect to the device and to fittings so to prevent tension at joints and terminal screws. Flexible cords are finely stranded for flexibility, so straining a cord can cause the strands of one conductor to loosen from the under-terminal screws and touch another conductor. Lockout and Tagout Equipment or circuits that are de-energized shall be rendered inoperative and shall have tags attached at all points where such equipment or circuits can be energized. Lockout Tag Steps Notify affected personnel shut down by normal procedure, isolate by using device, apply lock and tag, dissipate or restrain stored residual energy, verify lockout tagout, verify lockout and tagout. Hello, what is up here? Okay, or homemade? Homemade is not allowed. What is wrong with this picture? Exposure to unprotected conductors. Ladder safety. Incorrect. The left ladder does not extend far enough above the landing and is not tied off. It is also not on a flat surface, making the ladder unstable to climb. Correct. The right ladder extends three feet above the landing and is tied off to prevent slippage. And the ladder is level. Employees should always maintain three points of contact when climbing a ladder. When you need tools, supplies, or materials, use a rope to raise the materials from a higher level. Never climb with tools or supplies at the same time. Incorrect? Correct. Incorrect? Correct. To prevent the ladder from slipping, the ladder's feet are provided with slip-resistant rubber treads. If the treads are damaged or the feet are missing, remove the ladder from service and mark it for repair. Ladders should be inspected prior to use for loose or damaged rungs, steps, rails, or braces. Ladders should be free of any slippery material. Ropes and pulleys should have good lubrication. Ladders found to be defective should be taken out of service and marked for repair. When placing a ladder for use, you should maintain a height, H, to base, B, ratio of 4 to 1. If you're using a 24-foot ladder and the roof is 20 feet high, then the ladder should be at least 5 feet at its base. Factors that lead to falls. Carrying hand tools when ascending or descending the ladder. Selecting the wrong ladder for the job. 
Improper positioning of the ladder. Standing on the top rung of the ladder. Lack of attention. This man is not working safely from his ladder. He is stepping on the top rung of the ladder. The ladder is not long enough to safely reach the working area. The worker should have gotten a higher ladder. When materials must be moved to a higher level, use a rope to lift them up. Do not carry the materials up the ladder. This man is not staying within the confines of the ladder. Always reposition the ladder so it is as close as possible to the working area. Aerial Lift Safety Man Lifts You must be trained and certified to operate each specific lifting device. Do not exit the lift in an upright position. Never ride a lift in the upright position through open doorways. Do not move the lift in the up position, especially with someone in the basket. You must wear a body harness with a lanyard attached to the basket when working from an aerial lift. You must replace the guard wheel chain while working from a scissor lift. Always lower the scissor lift down prior to moving. Look for elevation changes in the concrete floor. This employee sustained a broken arm, several broken ribs, and a pulmonary embolism. Aerial Lift Electrocution A worker was painting a building from an aerial lift. He backed up without checking how close he was to a power line, and the lift touched the line. With the lift now energized, the worker tried to escape by climbing onto the roof and was unfortunately electrocuted. This ends the Trademaster's Orientation.